1956, a young woman in the Soviet Union is having a dance party with her friends. Everything's going great until she turned into a statue. And then what happens when you take ancient demonic rituals and combine them with modern technology? The answer will frighten you. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. Hope you guys are having a great day too. I hope you guys had an awesome weekend. First off, riding into Dead Rabbit Command on a massive caterpillar. Blah, 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 blah. It's one of our legacy Patreon supporters, Platinum Piss. Everyone give a round of applause to Platinum Piss. Eventually, that caterpillar will turn into a beautiful butterfly, but for now, it's just, it's just a big old caterpillar. It's eating everything green at Dead Rabbit Command. Platinum Piss, you're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode. If you guys can't support the Patreon, or if you don't eat plants, that's fine. Everyone eats plants, but if you're not a wolf, if you're not a carnivore, that's fine too. Just help spread the word about the show. Really, really helps out a lot. Do wolves eat plants? I'm going to look that up, because I think they do. Not all the time, not by choice, but I think if a wolf was really hungry, he'd be like, I'm eating those berries. Because dogs eat, like, lettuce and stuff. If you throw lettuce at a dog, (laughs) if you see a dog walking on the street, just throw a head of lettuce at them, they'll go, and they'll eat it. Don't throw heads of lettuce at dogs, but I'm pretty sure, like, if you gave a dog a hamburger that had lettuce on it, it would eat the lettuce. Everyone's, (laughs) right now, everyone's like, no, dude, dogs are allergic to lettuce. It's worse than chocolate. I'm all feeding a dog lettuce right now. I'm pretty sure dogs and wolves eat plants. That's the episode. That's the episode for today. Platinum Piss is like, oh man, this is my episode. Platinum, we got a ton of stuff to cover today, so forget forget that segue. I'm not going to edit it out, but forget it. I do want to say this, though. Before we get started on our adventure, I have something coming up this weekend, so I'm going to be taking a long weekend off. It'll probably be like a three, maybe four-day weekend, really depends. So there probably won't be any episodes until Tuesday of next week, and I'll do some reminders through the rest of the week. Sorry about that, guys. Just got something coming up that I can't avoid. I got to take care of it. But everything's fine. I'm totally healthy. Um, It's nothing like that. So don't worry. It's something, though, that I need to take care of. You're like, Jason, that's more mysterious. I thought it was medical. Now that it's not medical, don't worry about it. Don't worry. If you see any news, if you see anything pop up on the news, that wasn't me. I wasn't there. Platinum Piss. Platinum Piss is my accomplice in this adventure. I'm going to toss you the keys to the Dead Rabbit Dirigible. We're leaving behind Dead Rabbit Command, and we are headed out to the Soviet Union. And as we're headed out there, too, this is a really short story that I'm going to squeeze in here real quick. I want you guys to watch this video. I planned on doing a whole segment on it, but I just couldn't, it just wouldn't fit for time. And really, I want you guys to watch the video. You guys are like, Jason, I listen to the podcast because I don't like watching videos. They hurt my eyes. There's a video right now on a Facebook page of a sheriff's department in Florida. I'll have the links in the show notes. I'm going to make it brief. It's a police officer. It's Sheriff Deputy Royce James in Edgewater, Florida. He gets a call about a missing 13-year-old girl. And he has very, very limited information to go on. He's looking for this missing girl who her friend says she went to a hotel with someone whose name starts with T. It might be Tyler. He's from Orlando. And you just, it's this body cam footage. It's like five minutes. It's edited together. It's body cam footage of him visiting different motels and asking the managers questions. And then he gets the one the manager's kind of like grumpy, kind of like, oh yeah, I'll get out of bed because he's like lives on site. He's all sleeping on the job. People are trying to check and he's like, oh, go away, go away. He gets up, he goes and he's like, yeah, this guy checked in earlier, you know, and he hands the ID to the cop and the cop's like, oh, yeah, I want to know where this guy's at. I want to know what room this guy's at. And it's really, really cool. Like just based on that little bit of information. And it's also, he goes and he pretends to be like the maintenance crew or the manager or something, to get into the room. He's He knocks on the door, and he's like, oh, I need to get in a pipe burst. And the dude's like, there's no pipes in here. This is Motel 6. There's no running water. But the cop does get into the room, and the dude is absolutely petrified. And the cop keeps asking the dude, how old are you? How old are you? Because that's a big point in this with the missing 13-year-old girl. And while he's asking this guy how old he is, 
you see a blurry shape moving in the background. It's not a ghost story. It's not Samara crawling out of a television set. They blur the girl out for privacy because she's underage. You just see this blurry shape move out of the bedroom and hug the officer. Because whatever was going through her head when she arranged this date, she got in over her head. You know what I mean? Like, you may be thinking, oh, it'll be romantic, and she was in over her head, and the second that police officer showed up, she knew that things were going to be okay. And he keeps asking the dude, how old are you? (laughs) How old are you? And the guy is not saying anything, and he goes, if I have to ask you how old you are one more effing time, I'm going to lose my mind. And the guy tells him that he's 22. And he goes, you effed up, bro. You effed up. It's really, and that's the whole story. I mean, obviously he's going to go to trial and all that stuff. (laughs) The evidence is he's in the room. And I was looking through the charges and it doesn't look like anything happened to the girl. Anything like gross, anything. I mean, other than, you know, being in that situation in the first place. And she wanted the officer to be with her throughout the whole process. But he's not being charged with anything sexual. So that's good. It's an interesting video. I recommend you guys checking it out. I told you the ending, but it's still neat to see it from that perspective without all the flashy lights, except for the police lights. Those are flashy lights. Except for all the, like, the Hollywood stuff, just literally knocking on doors with very limited information. This police officer saved a 13-year-old girl. A blurry, blobby 13-year-old girl floating in the back room. So thank you. Sheriff's Deputy Royce James is really cool, and I recommend you guys watching that. Not you, Platinum Piss. You have to buy the world watching the video. Everyone's like, oh, that's really cool. Platinum Piss is crying. As he's flying us out to Russia, you have a job, bro. That's why he signed up for the Patreon, to not watch videos. I want to give a shout-out for this story. I got this story. I, I did other research, but I found out about this story from a YouTube channel called Obscure Lodge. But I want to give a shout out to them because I didn't know the story existed until I came across it from them. It's January 1956. And we're in Kubyshev, Russia. Now, nowadays, you're like, Jason, I don't know if a town like that, I don't think that's pronounced right at all. Well, maybe not. But nowadays, it's known as Samara, Russia. But as we're walking through the city of Kubyshev, the streets seem empty. There's like tumbleweed, there's like Russian tumbleweed rolling down the street. And then there's like birds... (laughs) You know, that means there's always birds. If there's no people around, there's birds there. The place looks empty, but we see everyone in town is gathered around a house, and everyone's like, get out of the way, man. I want to look through the window. And, like, dads are holding up their kids, and the kids are like, papa, papa, this is a miracle. This is miraculous. The dad's like, I wish I could see it. I wish I didn't have kids. I wish my kids were so strong they could hold me up. The reason why everyone's staring at this house is because inside this house, there's a statue. Not just any statue, it's a human statue. Not just a statue that's shaped like a human, because there's tons of those. It's a human frozen in place. Ugh! Now, let's go back in time a week. The crowd fades away. The statue is not a statue. It's actually a young woman named Zoya. And she shares this house with her mother. And Zoya is a partying girl. She's having lots of fun. As much fun as you can have in 1956 Soviet Union. I'm sure it wasn't a ton of fun, but I'm sure you find something to do, right? Well, she did. Zoya found something to do. It ended up turning her into a statue, but she found something to do. The mother went to church. The mother would go to church, and one day, Sunday in particular, Zoya's like, yeah, Mom, I'll go to church later. She's like, what? There's only one service. That's not the way it works. And Zoya's like, what? What? Can't hear you. And so the mother, I don't, know if, I don't know if they had that type of relationship. I don't know if she out and out lied to her mother. But the point is, is that the mother went to church one day and Zoya stayed home. And she decided to have a party at the house. Zoya was engaged to a guy named Nicholas. And Nicholas was supposed to come to the party. And Zoya's like, oh, girls, don't you just love my fiance? He's totally awesome. I can't wait to dance with him. And all the other girls are just dancing. And Zoya is so desperate to dance with Nicholas. Any Nicholas at this point. She grabs an icon of St. Nicholas off the wall and proclaims to the whole crowd, If there is no my Nicholas, then I will dance with St. Nicholas. She starts dancing with this little statue. Now, her friends realize this is a bad idea. I think we would all laugh, right? I mean, I don't know if you're Eastern Orthodox. Sorry if you are, and you'd be super upset by this. But I think if someone said that and they're dancing with a little statue, am I wrong? Am I wrong in that? Like, people, people are 
also in subscribing to the podcast. No, if you saw someone dancing like with a little statue of like St. Patrick, would you be like, I'm sure people do that all the time. Is that offensive? But apparently in the Soviet Union it is. It was, it might still be, but she's dancing with this little statue of St. Nicholas. And her friends are like, stop, stop the music, stop the music. Quit doing that. She's like, and she's still shaking her booty. And then, as her friends kept protesting and saying, dude, this is really super dangerous, she says, quote, if there is a God, then let him punish me. Now, here's the thing. I'm all, <laughs> I'm all fine with dancing with statues and stuff like that. But there's a thing called tempting fate. My dad always said he doesn't believe in superstitions, but he doesn't walk under ladders because if he goes, I don't believe in superstitions, and to prove you wrong, I'll walk under this ladder. He walks under the ladder and a paint can falls on his head. It only proves to the other people that superstitions are real. Don't believe in superstitions, but never test them because if something goes wrong, other people will believe in them. But after she says this, there's a blinding white flash of light. <laughs> Her mom, like, comes in right the moment where she's headed home from church. Can you imagine that? You're like, oh, man, I hope my daughter didn't get up to anything. You hear, boo doo boo doo boo 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 doo boo You're like, is my daughter singing again? Oh, dang it. I hate that song. She pulling into the driveway, and right when you're getting out of your car, you see a supernaturally bright flash coming out of your living room. As the mother opens the door, a whirlwind of air wraps around Zoya. The mother faints, obviously. You don't expect to see that. I think it was the fact that her daughter, her pride and joy, is now in a catatonic state. The doctors get called to the house and they test Zoya. They go, her heart's beating just fine. But she's frozen like a statue. She can't move her arms and her legs. She's just kind of posed there. Mid-dance, mid-booty wiggle. With a little, little finger in the air like she's doing the jitterbug. They tried giving her medicines. They tried, I'm assuming, injecting her with stuff. Now, I'm not going to say that the needles broke on her statue-like skin. I don't know for sure if they injected her with stuff. That would be the first thing I'd do. If someone was frozen like a statue, I'd start poking them with needles. Because first off, I'd think they were faking. Right? That's why I'm not a doctor. That's why I'm not a doctor. They're like, sir, this man's in a coma. And I'm like, hmm, I'm going to need my biggest needle for this stat. You poke them with a needle, right? And they go, ow! And then you know they're just joking. <laughs> I cannot, don't take this. If you are a doctor, do not do this, especially to me. Uh, you know, actually, it's so funny. I just looked at my notes. The needles did break. So I was making a joke earlier. I, <laughs> I guess the joke really is I should be reading my notes before I start. But they did try injecting her with stuff, and the needles broke. So there you go. Right away, that would work. I did show up. I'm a reincarnated Soviet doctor. I showed up with my special needles. The needles were breaking on her. She couldn't eat. She couldn't drink. They were actually trying to get her fluids. But she couldn't have them. And she didn't need them. She was in the state for 128 days. No food. No water. Broken needles littering the ground around her. I'm sure at a certain point, you would put her in bed. You want to just have her standing up in the middle of your living room. First off, it seemed to be super uncomfortable. If you're going to be frozen like a statue, you might as well be frozen like a statue on your back. Secondly... That'd be really hard to move around. It's a tragedy that your daughter's turned into a statue, but you do have to vacuum, right? Especially with all those broken needles. You do have to be able to watch television. And she's standing right in front of the television. So you pick her up and you like lay her down on the couch. Now, some people go, she must have just been in a catatonic state. And she may have been. There it might be an actual reasonable answer for this. But just when you start to realize that, okay, maybe my daughter's a statue... And this might be, I mean, after, after day 100, this, this might be permanent. But right when you were starting to get used to the fact that your daughter was a statue, every so often, she would talk. And she wouldn't say stuff like, can you please get Dr. Carpenter away from me? He just brings bigger and bigger needles. She would scream. She would start screaming about how the whole world was going to burn. Everyone was going to die. We're all going to die. Everything's going to be destroyed. And then she'd be frozen again. People were going to surround the house. People wanted to see this woman because you wouldn't believe it at first. You would think maybe she's just tricking me. Maybe eventually if I turn away real quick, she's going to move. But no, she was there for 120 days. The police in the area had to come in to maintain order. I'm sure people were trying to break in to get a closer look at the statue woman, Zoya. But she stayed there for 128 days. She was actually a statue until Easter. 
And on the very eve of the holiday... (gasps) Oh man, I'm awake. She's awake now and the mom comes running out. She's like, oh dude, what's going on? What's going on? And the doctors show up and they go, how did you survive for so long? Like you didn't eat or drink anything for 128 days. And Zoya looks at him and she goes, oh no, no, the pigeons fed me. These pigeons were coming in and feeding me. And everyone's like, what? There's no pigeons in here. So the mom's eyes go from side to side. She's been eating pigeons. She's been, where do these pigeons keep flying in my house? She's eating them. Where'd they get all this bird seed from? Nom, 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 nom. The daughter's crying. She's like, that's my bird seed. I need that. She said the pigeons were feeding her, but she was inside the whole time. Now, this is where the story gets a little puzzling, but also this is where the story gets verified. But first, let's do the puzzling part. Some say that after she awoke, she went to a hospital and she was there for the rest of her life. Like the event was so traumatic that she never recovered physically or mentally. You figure being a statue for 128 days would, you know, make your muscles sore or (laughs) dead. But, you know, you could work back from that. You could, like, start, like, doing a whole, like, training montage and eventually get back from that. Some people say that she died three days later. Like, she she broke out of it. She's like, yes. She's hunting down doctors with a bunch of needles. She's like, I'll show you what's what. No! And after she takes her revenge on all the needles who poked her, she dies three days later. Uh, I made up the doctor part. (laughs) Actually, what happened was she was alive for three days, and then God forgave her for being blasphemous towards St. Nicholas, and then she died peacefully. She died redeemed. Some people say that's how the story ends. And then other people say she joined a convent. Which, out of the three... That one's far, far preferable, right? Being locked up in a hospital, dying after three days, or just joining a convent. Nobody knows for sure. What's funny, though, is when I was reading this story, I go, this obviously is, it's a cautionary tale against, you know, being blasphemous. We've come across stories like that. Don't go towards the river. There's some snake god in there that'll devour your soul. And really, that's a story to tell idiots, quit playing around the river. It's super dangerous. And people go, what? No, I'm brave. I can do that. So you spin this tale about some cryptid that lives in the river that eats the souls of young boys, and that scares them away. So you have that. That's what I thought this was. This story happened. Now, we don't know if she was in a catatonic state or if it was a curse from God, which, considering how many people do stuff way worse than dancing with the icon of St. Nicholas... Half the world's population would be frozen in place. We don't know if it was that, if it was an act of God, or if it was a medical condition. But something did happen. It was actually real enough that there was a Communist Party conference in the area in the year 1956. So that year, the Communist Party had this meeting, and they addressed it. It's actually in their notes. They had to debunk it. They had to come out and say, this isn't real. And you go, well, Jason, if they're debunking it, then why are you saying it's real? Well, because you had local figures say that it was. Go, no, 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 no. This actually was real. This woman was turned into a statue. And you take a look at the story of Father Dimitri. He was a priest in this town who said that he visited Zoya and said, I saw that she was a statue. And the Communist Party said, that's not true. The story's not true. She might have had some medical thing, but there she wasn't a statue. Maybe it was like for 128 hours, but it wasn't that. It wasn't what you're saying. Father Dimitri insisted so much that this story was true, they threw him in prison. People were being imprisoned for saying the story was true. Now, most of the time, if someone's spinning a yarn about UFOs or, or Bigfoot or something like that, if the authorities threaten to throw them in prison... It's over with, right? You're going to be like, oh no, Bigfoot, no, I totally made that up. I made those prints themselves. People were going to prison over this story because they actually believed it. In the year 2010, the city of Kubyshev actually built a monument to St. Nicholas. They really like him that much. And on this monument is a little plaque that mentions the story of Zoya. Now, that's not proof, right? I mean, you can do that. I can build a plaque right now. Be like, Jason Carpenter, he fought the goat man. And it doesn't mean anything. But it's still another little interesting twist to this story. I think most likely that it happened in some sense. The time period, it may not have been 128 days. Probably wasn't just 128 hours. But somewhere in in between that vast amount, Something probably happened to this woman. Was it a paranormal event outside of God? Was it an act of God to punish her for her blasphemy? Was it a medical condition 
that turned her skin as hard as stones. It's the things with needles breaking off. Like, I don't... That's something that I think was added on later. Because God, what would point... Why would God be like, not only am I going to curse you, I'm going to give you superhuman strength. Like, that part doesn't make sense. I think that part was added on. And it's funny because I just had made a joke about that. And then I read two lines down in my notes. And that was actually the truth. And I think that shows, like, parts of the story probably are true. Parts of it have probably been glommed on. But there's a lot of paranormal events that I've actually seen. And no matter how true I thought they were, if someone threatened to send me to prison, if I kept talking about the Shadow Men, I'd be like, okay, I'll stop talking about Shadow Men. Back off. So the fact that people were going to prison to tell this story seems to give it more credence. Now, they could be telling the story because they think it's so important that people aren't blasphemous, but it's an interesting story nonetheless. It did go on a little bit longer than I thought it would, but I wanted to get all that information in because really, if it happened once, it could happen again. If you planned on going to that dance party tonight and you didn't have a partner, but you were eyeing up that little religious icon on your wall, no, don't do it. The Dead Rabbit Radio recommends not dancing with religious icons. Platinum Piss, I'm going to toss you the keys to the carpenter copter. We are leaving behind Russia. and We are headed out to Tibet. <laughs> now, this story was sent to me by Christian via Facebook. So thank you, Christian, for sending this over. I'd never heard of this before. The reason why we're in Tibet, we're now in an old abandoned monastery carved in the side of a mountain. There's snow whipping around everywhere. <sighs> Tibetan tumbleweed rolling by, birds. No one's been here for a long time. We're walking through this darkened monastery, flickering flashlights. Probably should have brought batteries, but uh, didn't. Didn't. It's too busy dancing with those statues. The reason why we're in this monastery is we're looking for a particular item. You can actually buy these off Etsy. I don't know why we went all the way out to this abandoned monastery. You can buy them on Etsy. They're kind of. We come across this instrument. It's probably about... A foot long, has two balls on the end of it, and it's a long shaft. And you guys look at each other, and I'm like, yes, I found the relic. You guys are like, uh. I hold it up. I hold it up. It's not what you think. It's called the Kangling, a.k.a. the Leg Flute. I guess that is kind of what you think it is, but it's not that. It's still not that. The Leg Flute is actually the thigh bone of either a criminal Ugh, give me all your money, Buddhist people. Someone who died a violent death. Psh, oh, no, I've been shot by a criminal. I should have given him all my money. Or a respected teacher. There's a guy in the corner going, I should have taught you more jujitsu so you could fight off that armed robber. A thigh bone from any one of those three people. I wonder what happened if it's all three from the same person, like a respected criminal who died a violent death. Jesse James. I don't know, but dig him up. Dig up Jesse James and find out. You take the thigh bone and then you can hollow it out and you turn it into this kangling, this leg flute. It makes a very eerie noise. I wish I could play a, a segment for you, but it would just flag a hundred different copyright violations. But I'll put stuff in the show notes so you can listen to these. And you may have already heard one, honestly. We'll talk about that in a second. There's a thing known as the chode ritual where you blow on the leg flute and a demon comes out of the darkness. <sighs> it's walking towards you and you're going <laughs> Soya's dancing in the corner she's dancing to your jaunty tune you're playing this kingling and this demon comes to you so you're like are you making a deal with the devil like what's the what's going on here it's actually pretty altruistic you want the demon to come to you and it begins to nibble on your soul as you're playing this kangling. The kangling, now, now it is becoming jazz. The demon actually is feeding on you. And the reason why you do this is so the demon can't go out and bother other people. The instrument is designed to attract demons to you. Now, other people say it, it's used to curb the ego. So basically, as the demon comes to you, it's basically keeping your ego in check. It's eating that part of your soul. So it may not be entirely altruistic all the time, but it does have that component. If the demon's busy nibbling on your soul, it's not out tormenting mankind. You can buy a kangling, like I said, on Etsy, but they're usually wooden or resin nowadays. If you want a authentic kangling, you can still buy those as well, but there's obviously like human trafficking, body part trafficking laws going on. 
but there is a market for them. I think if it's already in your country of origin, it's easier for you to get rather than trying to order them from Tibet. And I have no idea why, where Tibet's getting all these thigh bones. I don't really want to know. But it's a very, very interesting thing. Christian, thanks for sending that over. But while I was researching this, this kangling, I was listening to samples of it. And I realized that it's been translated to a medium that I don't think it should ever be a part of. You've all probably heard of these in movie soundtracks. There's actually an FX thing I'm going to post in the show notes where it's like, hey, you can add this kangling to your synthesizer. So you can actually play out songs on your digital keyboard. So if you want to make a cool song, and have these horns playing in the background, there you go. They even have this drum that is supposedly made from a human scalp that's also used in the chode ritual. They're like, download this pack. Download the demon summoning pack made from the body parts of convicted murderers. Buy it now. It's only $19.99 or something like that. And then, if you've played the game Doom Eternal, there is the Exultia song. That's an actual kangling being played in that song. It's funny, when you go to the YouTube video, people are like, dude, epic trumpets in the background, because that's basically what it is, a trumpet. And the guy who composed the music is like, oh no, that's a kangling. That's my kangling. This stuff's being transported into modern music, and not just modern music, digital music. You are taking an instrument that is designed to summon demons and transporting it to the digital realm. Guys, this is dangerous. This is irresponsible. This is an insane. This is a tool. It's not an instrument. It's no more of an instrument than a heart monitor. You can kick a dope beat to a heart monitor. Dude, dude, dude. You know, scare him, tickle him a bit. Do, 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 do kick it down. But it's not a musical instrument. The kangling is not a musical instrument. It is a device used to summon demons. And you're putting it in video games. It's being put on these sample packs. It's going to start... It's a really cool sound. It's going to start showing up in movies. More movies. It's going to start showing up in more video games. It's going to start showing up on musical albums more and more and more. You go, Jason... If you play it, it only brings the demon to the person who's playing it. We don't know what the long-term... I'm going to sound like a scientist here, but we don't know what the long-term ramifications are going to be on listening to an instrument that is designed to attract demons over the course of time. We don't. Make Make a scientist research that. Do it. Do it right now. We don't know what's going to happen. Sure. The device is used to summon the demon to the person who's playing it. Well, great. Now the person who's playing it is designing my video game soundtracks. I don't want that. That guy has a bunch of demons hanging out with him. I mean, this is nuts. It's not a musical instrument. It sounds dope. It's super spooky. I can't play you a sample for copyright reasons, but you'll hear it in the show notes if you want. If you want a bunch of demons showing up in your house. But at a certain point, we won't be able to... Protect. What are you supposed to do? Not watch any horror movies or play any video games? This, it's going to be everywhere soon. I was able to find the sample of the Doom game, but I'm sure it's other places. And because it's in the sample pack, it's going to be even more popular. I'm sure some of you guys, I know a lot of musicians listen to this show, you may want to fool around with this as well. And I'm telling you guys, it is irresponsible. We do not know the long-term ramifications of playing demon-summoning music in Doom Eternal. We don't know what the ramifications are if you play it during Animal Crossing. A game where you're intently focused, where you're playing levels over and over again because you're a scrub, and you're just hearing that over and over and over again. You could say, oh, maybe they're using the resin ones, maybe they're using the wood ones. I doubt it. I know musicians, they love exotic instruments they love to have these exotic sounds and they love to have a backstory behind their instruments i can't say for sure but knowing musicians i would bet money that the samples on the sample pack and the version that's coming in the doom eternal game is played on an actual authentic kangling a thigh bone that was used in this tibetan ritual it is not a musical instrument it makes a musical sound (laughs) that doesn't mean you can add it to your ska band This is dangerous stuff. This is dangerous stuff.
we thought backmasking was a thing in the 80s, were taking things that were designed to be demonic summoning rituals and putting them into our entertainment. We are an entertainment consumption culture. And that sound could very soon be everywhere in our culture. If it isn't already. I almost feel like the dude in Invasion of the Body Snatchers who's just realized that there's a bunch of pod people showing up, but it's not even pod people. It's demons attracted to trumpets. Which is way scarier. You just push a pod into a lake and it floats away. I don't know if that's how they defeated him. I don't know actually remember how that movie ended. I think the pod people won. My point is, is that this isn't good. This is not a good turn of events for humanity. It may make your soundtrack really cool and spooky and powerful. But those are also words that people describe demons. Not really cool. Some people think they're cool, but I think they're kind of lame. But the spooky part and the powerful part... Yeah, I'll agree with those. So, I almost feel like, you know those conspiracy theorists that you see in movies, or maybe you are one in real life and you're listening to this podcast, the guy who realized that he's randomly stumbled across, quote-unquote, the truth, and no one in the world will believe him? I don't want to go on this huge rant about don't play video games anymore because if they put it into Minecraft, I don't know what I'm going to do. But... I think this could be a serious problem. I think that when people talk about violence in video games, we all kind of scoff at them. I think it's ridiculous. But at a certain point, not now, but eventually they may be half right. They may say Doom Eternal causes real world violence. And I'll be like, okay, I'll give you that. (laughs) I'll give you that one because it has a demon music in it. But as these instruments become more popular and people want this sound more and more and more, these demons could be everywhere. You could just pop in an action movie that you want to watch. They want that epic sound of those trumpets, but they want it to be a little darker so the composer adds that noise of the kingling. It's a really good action movie. You have a lot of fun watching it. It gets the blood pumping. But that night as you're going to bed and you're shutting the lights off in your house, you swear you see something move behind your couch. We love our entertainment. It's a part of our lives. And it would be the perfect place for a demonic entity to hide. No. It would be the perfect place for a demonic invasion to start. And the armies of hell may march into our reality to the sounds of a kangling. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash DeadRabbitRadio. Twitter is at DeadRabbitRadio. DeadRabbitRadio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. (laughs) 